Welcome everyone. This is lecture number six. Today I'm going to present uh, object detection with the algorithm proposed by Viola and Jones. This is the sixth uh, and last lecture of the conventional computer vision block before we then transition into neural information processing. So let's start by asking how much pixels, how much resolution do we actually need to detect that a certain instance uh, sample is either, I don't know, a car or a non-car. So let me ask you, what is this? And um, let's increase in uh, resolution. And then do you now see what that is? And I'm going to increase that even more. And I think that should be obvious right now. And it, I guess you might even be able to say not just what it is, but also who that is. So today's paper, um, written by Paul Viola and Michael Jones, actually a famous paper, uses exactly this observation. We don't need a lot of pixels to detect faces. What is the idea in this paper? Um, I downloaded a data set called Celeb A, which consists of 200 and something thousand um, photos of faces. And I created a, uh, an average face. So, you know, the average face has like dark hair and you know, bright uh, forehead and darker eyes and like cheekbones that kind of shine through and a little darker mouth. And that, that is what um, what our face, like, like average standard face looks like. And now the idea here in this paper is we can kind of do exactly what I said. Um, you know, this region is darker and that region is, is brighter. Uh, we can formalize that by introducing simple patterns uh, like that. Um, you know, th th those two bars here, the black and the white bar. And we'll combine many, many, many of them to match those against a new sample. And the way they match and the way we evaluate these many, many of these simple features lets us um, detect faces with high accuracy. So the patterns we will be looking for are just very simple uh, you know, rectangular features. We call them two rect, three rect, and four rect features. And they basically encode exactly what I said. So brightness differences vary in very like coarse regions. We also call those weak learners because given an input, their value may be predictive for the target class, but only, you know, slightly over chance. So we have to combine many of these to create a strong classifier. Now, our goal is to find exactly those 200 features that best predict whether an input is a face or not. And we'll start with a huge number of those features and we'll we only use a very small input um, image and you know you may ask yourself okay, how, how do we even get so many features there are only like three types well it's exactly um, and, you know a number of parameters uh, 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 or a list of parameters that actually define the position and the size and you know how are those uh, blocks arranged and one setting of these parameters gives us one feature so, you know, varying all those parameters, you know, gives us a whole list of, or a whole distribution of features. And now the goal is uh, which ones are the best. So the first step today um, to understand the Will Jones paper is how do we even evaluate a given feature? And so let's say we are given that feature position, that feature scale, uh, a certain parity, right? So this could also be a black and the, the sides could be white, but now this one is 
um, you know, has black boxes here and the white box in the middle. The output of that feature is just the sum of all pixel brightnesses that overlap with that white region. And we subtract the sum of all pixel pixel values in those black regions, right? So for all pixels in the positive region, sum of all sum of the, the image brightnesses and subtract um, all the image brightnesses for the pixels in the negative region. So we do that for 160,000 features for only one of those inputs. So isn't that slow? Yes, it is slow and we have to accelerate that. So we do that with a thing called integral image, which is basically, you know, taking in an image and it computes like the cumulative sum uh, over the entire image from top, top left to uh, bottom right. So a given um, position in the integral image gives you the sum of all pixels of the input image from that position, you know, to the origin as depicted here. To now evaluate regions that are somewhere in the image, but do not cover the entire area up until the origin, like for example, a region called D here in this example, we have to look up four values in the integral image. So to sum up the image pixels within this region D, we access four locations within the integral image uh, at position four, two, three, and one um, in that kind of fashion. So integral image at position four now gives you the entire region that I outline here. So uh, including all those four regions. And so we need to get rid of uh, region B, D, uh, sorry, B, A, and C. And we do that by subtracting uh, the integral image at position three and at position two. And since we, um, you know, by doing that, subtract twice region A, we need to add it once because we only wanted to subtract it once. Okay. So that now allows us to compute the value of a two rect or a three rect or a four rect feature with a constant number of lookups. So the question is, how many times do we have to access the integral image for a two rect, three rect or four rect feature? Let me tell you, it's not 8, 12, and 16 times. Let me know in the Q&A. So how do we compute the integral image? Well, we just, you know, um, iterate over all pixel positions, row by row, column by column. And for the uh, pixel position x, y, we just access the previous one in the same row. Sorry, in the, uh, yeah, in the same row. So just the leftwards pixel. We add up the pixel above, and by the same logic as before, we need to subtract the you know left diagonal value to subtract that one block. And then, of course, we have to add the actual image uh, pixel at position x and y. So to reiterate, our goal was to find those 200 best features from a large set of features that could be distributed you know anywhere in our input image. So for example, these may be only those that are predictive of the target class. And we speed up the feature evaluation with the integral image, not just for you know, the training um, phase in which we you know, start off with those 160K features, but also for production. So you know, we will get an image frame or a camera frame and remember, our faces are only small 24 pixels by 24 pixels. And now we will scan through our camera frame. And for each given position, we need to evaluate our 200 features. So we still get many 10, maybe many hundred thousand of evaluations. And so the integral image um, comes in handy also in production. 
Now, the next two steps are, how do we find those 200 best features? And we'll use something that's called boosting. I'm gonna explain that. And in the end, we will optimize the evaluation of the classifier um, by building a so-called cascade. Okay, let's have a look at how to build a strong classifier from many, many, many weak classifiers. And uh, Viola and Jones, in their paper, used an algorithm called AdaBoost for adaptive boosting, proposed some 25 years ago by Freund and Schapire. So what is a weak classifier or a weak learner? Well, weak refers to the um, performance of that classifier because it's not that strong, right? It will um, most of the time be um, incorrect or correct, but only slightly better than chance. Okay, so here in a binary classification task, uh, we would uh, assume in a, in a balanced kind of data uh, set that um, a weak learner is slightly better than um, 50, uh, at 50 percent accuracy. So formally, we introduce this uh, weak classifier H as a function that evaluates to one or zero. Um, inputs are the window we want to classify X, the feature F given at a certain position, scale, and so on and so on, and two more parameters, P for parity and theta for the threshold. So H evaluates to one if the function value exceeds the threshold, but now we use the parity, which kind of um, could either be one or minus one, so it flips the uh, direction with which we look at the, the, the threshold. So it, if, um, for example, P is minus one, um, you know, we evaluate H to one if F evaluates to a value larger than theta, and if P is one, it needs to be smaller than theta. No? Um, the final strong classifier now consists of capital T many weak ones. Um, H, T, um, and T, you know, goes from one to capital T. And we introduce an individual weight alpha T that is associated to this weak learner. And that just means that some, you know, um, weak classifiers here have a stronger weight in this entire sum here than others. And we evaluate the um, final output of the strong classifier to one only if that sum of um, those classifier weights you know, for those uh, weak learners that actually say it is a phase, um, if that sum is larger than half of the sum of all weights. And, and we will see later that we will uh, replace that threshold, but just for now, you know, uh, just a ballpark measure, if my input window X, which goes in that function, um, evaluates to something larger than half of what the weights are, then I say it's a phase. So besides using individual weights for each weak learner, we now introduce individual weights for single um, samples in the training set. So let's have a look at this example. We use a two-dimensional feature space, X and Y, or X1 and X2. And we have samples um, that are either faces, so positive samples, or non-faces, negative samples. The classifier that we'll use is a weak learner. Um, it's called a decision stump because it actually just um, divides the space in two uh, half spaces and the positive half space here in the left and the negative half space here in the right. Um, it does so just by looking at one feature and uh, using a threshold. So everything that uh, in that feature is you know, smaller than that threshold will be a positive output or uh, otherwise a negative. 
And so we'll start by training that decision stump and um, using, you know, um, uniform weights over all those samples. And we'll find an optimal decision uh, boundary here that will lead to a, a correct classification for these two positive samples and a correct classification for these five negative samples, but, for, uh, but uh, to an incorrect uh, classification of these uh, three positive samples. And in effect, we will now increase the weight of these individual samples and retrain a second decision stump. And the decision boundary that it now finds, which is optimal given that distribution of weights, is now here. Um, you know, correctly classifying those two negative samples, correctly classifying those five positive samples, but incorrectly classifying those three remaining negative samples. Re-weighting now these three samples, because these are the ones that have been incorrectly classified, and continuing that whole idea will then lead to another decision stump that finds its decision boundary on the y-axis at that position. And now we can combine these three stumps into a final classifier that does not make any mistakes anymore, right? So this is called a committee. Um, so we have a lot of classifiers that we combine um, their uh, individual um, decisions into a global final decision. So this is an outline of uh, the algorithm. Let's just go through it step by step. So given example images x1, y1, which is a image and a label, Right, so yi is the target label, which is zero for no phase, one for phase. We then initialize our data weights as either one over two m or one over two l, um, and that depends on whether the sample is uh, from the positive class, so the faces or the non-faces. Well, actually, l is here for the for the faces, yeah. And then we iterate uh, over um, a number of um, weak classifiers. So we start at one and stop at capital T. And we first normalize our weights um, as depicted here so that they sum up to one. And then we select the best weak classifier with respect to an error. And that step is what we'll look at now. Okay, so how do we determine which is the best weak learner from our set of 160,000 uh, weak classifiers that we have? So let's have a look at a couple of examples of faces and non-faces and a couple of features um, that we all evaluate on these images. Um, remember, they do not yet come with a binary classification. These were the function h, i. Um, the f's are just really the you know, sum of pixel values uh, and then minus the other sum of pixel values. And so remember, these have a certain position in the image, a certain scale and a certain you know, configuration of where black and white is. What we don't know yet is what the optimal setting for the threshold and for the parity is. So let's have a look at how we can determine that um, computationally efficient. We start by sorting the features output for each sample such that we have a list of ascending uh, you know, values. Now, to determine the optimal threshold, just think of, okay, what could these be? And uh, so remember the threshold divides this set of samples into a negative and positive sub, uh, half space, um, or if the parity is switched into uh, a positive and negative. 
Um, and so what thresholds theta would actually make sense testing? So think of a threshold, for example, of, of zero. So that partition of that space wouldn't make any sense. And let's compare a threshold of one that would introduce the division of the space here, or uh, then a threshold of two, which would have the same kind of partition. So let me ask you, how many different threshold values make actually sense to test? Okay, so I'll give you that answer. The total number that we actually have to test is at max n. So if all of those n samples have different values in their feature evaluation. But now given the sorted um, you know, uh, sequence of, of feature values, we can now um, test out settings for the threshold th theta. Uh, given a, a parity setting and optimize these two values such that the error that we introduce is minimal and we define that error to be the sum of all those weights that are associated to samples that have been incorrectly classified right so um, faces that have been classified as non-faces and non-faces that have been classified as faces. I here is the indicator variable, you know, if that uh, condition is, one, uh, is true, then I becomes one, zero otherwise. Now we minimize that error by step by step uh, computing the error for a given setting uh, of theta and parity. And we will start with a parity of minus one and then we'll iterate over all possible and at max and many um, theta values. Now we start with theta equals one, and for that setting, um, you know, we have an output of that weak learner of zero, uh, and so that would make these samples negative samples, which would be an error for that positive sample. And all those samples on the right would be positive samples, which would be uh, uh, erroneous for that negative sample here. The idea now, which is pretty great, is that we'll keep two numbers, one that we call S plus and another one that we call S minus, that represent, like uh, written down here, the sum of weights of positive and of negative samples in the left partition. The uh, sum, the total sum of weights for negative samples, T minus will be constant, right? So that is what we have after every iteration. Um, and now the, the error now for that specific setting is just the sum of these, these three values. So the sum of weights of positive samples in the left partition, which is this one. So that was the incorrectly classified positive sample. Plus all the negative samples minus the ones that are in the left partition, because these are the correct ones. Right. So that means only that one. Yeah, that, that one uh, remains because here in this example, we only have two negative samples their sum um, is t minus and we subtract that weight here okay in the next step now we will change the threshold value we keep parity at minus one and the threshold will be three yeah? and now those um, values for s plus and s minus just have to account for a change um, of that one sample, right? So we'll keep the sum of weights of positive samples in the left partition because that is the only one that remained here. That is a new sample that we uh, that we received in that 
a partition, but it's a negative one. And so the sum of weights of negative samples in the left partition increases by the weight of that sample. Okay. And so we continue um, uh, stepping up our theta value until we reach the last threshold here. And then, of course, we have to test for the parity equals one case, uh, which would flip the identity of those half spaces. So this would then be the positive half space. And negative samples now are the ones that we have to identify and uh, for which we have to uh, add up those weights. Huh? On the right side now, uh, we have our negative space and the positive samples. Uh, or the weight for those positive samples will be um, summed up to uh, get an error for this setting um, of theta and parity. And we'll still use S plus and S minus, but we'll now use T plus, which is the total sum of weights for positive samples. And now the error for that setting is the number, sorry, the sum of weights of positive samples in the left partition, uh, sorry, <laughs> Some weight of negative samples in the left partition, so that is, you know, that sample here, plus all the weights um, that we have um, for positive samples minus the ones that are correctly classified. Okay, so in the end, this makes this expression. So we have to minimize e by, you know, iterating over all different thetas. For the one parity, that gives us the best setting um, that is, you know, left of the comma here. And then for the other parity, we'll iterate over all different thresholds, and that is that uh, error here, and we'll minimize, or we use the argument to get the setting that is best for that given feature, at that position, at that scale, and so on. So the next steps are pretty easy. We have to update our data weights um, and this will be done using uh, so-called beta values. So beta actually just scales the weight for the sample um, that the classifier, the teeth classifier, has correctly classified, right? So that sample works, let's decrease its weight. And we'll use this beta uh, as a function of the error. Um, so if our error was high, the beta is close to one. And that means that our weight remains unchanged or almost unchanged. Um, but if we have a low error on the data set, that means the classifier that we have chosen performs well on many samples, those weights for those samples that have been classified correctly will be reduced pretty drastically. Now, question. Based on what I said, um, and also please have a look at this main loop and the first step, we normalize those weights. What is the error of the best classifier at max? Let's have a look in the Q&A session. And finally, we have to update the alpha t. So those are the coefficients that weigh the weak classifiers, the weak learners in that sum that we've saw, that we've seen in the beginning. So beta now determines the setting of that alpha. So if beta was close to one, that means the error was pretty high, the resulting alpha is pretty low. So the weight of the classifier um, is pretty low. Now, beta values close to zero now indicate a very good error, so a low error. That means the, the alpha are the alpha values, the weight in that committee uh, classifier is pretty high. Uh, remember, that was what our classifier looked like. Okay, so you should probably pause the video here to digest what you just learned. If you're ready, just resume and let's have a look at how we can now use that classifier to uh, detect faces in much larger input images. Remember our uh, 
window was at a fixed size. And we'll what we'll do is we'll just shift these um, over um, the image until we at some point, you know, hopefully hit a face. And for each of these positions, we evaluate our classifier and we will get a one or a zero. Yeah. So well, what we'll probably see is that we have multiple detections. So uh, scanning over the image with a stride of one or two pixels um, will result in positive detections, right? Pa positive classifications of many windows. So our uh, goal would then probably be to, um, you know, do a non-maximum suppression here. Now the next step and uh, one of the major contributions of this paper was um, this cascade classifier. So one observation is that the vast majority of those windows that we shift over an input image are non-faces. And so we still would use all the 200 weak learners in our final stage classifier um, to reject images that show no faces. And um, this may be much, a much simpler uh, you know, endeavor as to detect the, 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 the positive faces. And so the idea is we train a cascade classifier, which is uh, really just a degenerate decision tree that uh, goes like that. We uh, input a one of those sub-windows, and in the first stage, we have a uh, boosted classifier with only two or three of these uh, simple um, weak learners. So for example, here, uh, the authors just use two. So this eye kind of uh, feature and the nose feature. Um, and that rejects already 50% of the global non-faces. And then, but all windows that pass that stage are then subjected to a more complex classifier. And we're not gonna go over the details of how to train um, you know, ever more complex classifiers and how many of these features do we have to uh, take into account and what's the false uh, positive rate and false negative rate here. Uh, but you can read that paper and um, read other sources to understand how that works. Okay, people, that was uh, the algorithm by Bill and Jones. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, leave a comment and collect your answers to those questions I post. See you all on Wednesday. Bye.